Okay, and today I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the new edition of the Mineralogy of Arizona that's finally coming out. Uh, it's at page proof stage right now, and I'm not sure how soon the U of A press will do it. They're, we are pushing on them for the Tucson show, but they refuse to promise us, so uh, not sure. Um, it's been 27 years, if this comes out in ne next year, since the last edition, since the third edition was published. And we've come a long way, really, in a sense, since then, uh, you know, with the things that we found and the information that we have. Uh, we have 992 species listed in this edition for the state of Arizona. We really wanted a thousand, but of course, <laughs> there's no way we were going to get there, I guess. <clears throat> 233 new species. I'll talk a little more about that in a few minutes. Arizona right now is home of 87 type minerals. Those are minerals that were first found in the state of Arizona before they were found anywhere else, in case you don't know about that. 27 years. And We've decided that we'd like to go with colored pictures of the minerals that the earlier editions didn't have. So, and the, the colored pictures will be with the mineral. So you go to the mineral calcite, there'll be a picture of calcite on that page with the calcite. And we have, and they've accepted it, over 300 different photographs mm -hmm. that'll be in that text. So that's really good. The U of A Press has it on their site already. Uh, they claim it's $49.95, which I can't believe, but it's incredible if they can do that. And the 800, it's, it's much bigger than the last edition. Okay, so we have, these are the chapters, four chapters, the introduction, gemstones, lapidary materials, fluorescent materials, those are new chapters. The mineral occurrences is the you know, where these are all found, which contains the information from the last edition plus the new edition, and then a new chapter, Arizona Mineral Districts. And a whole series of appendices, and we'll talk a little bit more about those later in the talk. I, I wanted to say just a little bit about the history of mineralogy in Arizona. I've really been looking into it, uh, and we have a little bit in the, in the, in the book. And these are people that made lists of minerals. I mean, there's endless quantities of literature about mineralogy or minerals in Arizona. In fact, in our new book, we have over a thousand references to you know, individual papers about individual occurrences. So, you know, but these are the people that made lists. So the first list that we can really sort of find is William Blake, 1866, and he listed 14 minerals from Arizona with a list of minerals that he made from California. And then, for whatever reason, he moved to Arizona and became the professor of mining and geology uh, at the U of A here, uh, 1895 to 1909. And he was re appointed the territorial mineralogist in 1898. He died in... Uh, 1910, and he was still the territorial mineralogist. So they actually had a guy, the state mineralogist of the state of Arizona back then. And he did a report, 1909, and he listed 102 minerals. And you can find that report online. It was actually published in the newspaper at the time. The governor, it was for the, it says it's a report for the governor of the state. So uh, it seemed maybe there was a more widespread interest in minerals <laughs> back then. And then the next thing, Frank Guild, who was also a professor at the University of Arizona, and he, they had to be there at the same time, uh, <clears throat> he published this list, and it's privately published. It was published by a company in eastern Pennsylvania, uh, and he lists 130 minerals, and he refers to Blake's 1909 report several times in the footnotes, but he didn't include all the minerals Blake had. So I'm not sure. I have a feeling that two of these guys were both at the U of A, and they may have been a little bit competitive about you know who was doing what. So uh, we'll never know that, of course. But uh, I mean, you know, one guy comes out one year with 100 and 
plus minerals. The next guy comes out a year later with 130 minerals, but he doesn't include all the ones from the guy the year before. So uh, who knows? Then <clears throat> Frederick Galbraith, who was also here at the University of Arizona, and I'm sure he was a professor, says assistant professor, but I suspect he was a professor. Uh, and he was a curator of the Mineral Museum here from 41 to 61. And when I went online to try to find pictures of him, I could only find pictures of him getting awards for uh, his service in the Army in World War II. And then uh, Ron found, or Harvey found this picture uh, uh, of him at the museum. So he's uh, on the left there. And he has three editions. In uh, 1941, he had 267 minerals. In 47, it was up to 284. In 53, he had 377. The 53 one has been reprinted multiple times. In uh, 1970, I think they reprinted it again, but they didn't change it. And, and somewhere along the line, one place I saw it said fourth edition, but it's not. It's the same exact publication. And it's online now at the... Uh, Arizona Geological Survey, you can go there and find it. Arthur Flagg, who we're here with the Flagg Mineral Foundation today, he had this publication, uh, Mineralogical Journeys, which is sort of just a story about all the places wandering around the state. He, he wasn't real careful about telling you where stuff was. He, he apparently liked to sort of make people think about it and go out and search. But in the back of that book, he has lists of minerals. And his list for Arizona had 1,408, 418 different minerals on it. So that's why we've included them. Anybody that had a real list went to the trouble of finding all the minerals and putting them in a list. A couple of things I did, 82, the Mineralogical Society of Arizona, we published a, book, a checklist of Arizona minerals that had uh, 605 minerals. It was in between the uh, second and third edition of the mineralogy. Um, in 2007, the Arizona Department of Mines and Mineral Resources, which doesn't exist anymore, published the second edition of it. And I had a lot of help with before they passed away with Sid Williams and uh, Dick Badeau in, in doing that. And then the one that we're contemplating having the fourth edition of is the Mineralogy of Arizona. John Anthony was the head author. He was, again, a professor here at the U of A. Sid Williams and Dick Badeau. And then the first two editions, the, the first edition had 577 minerals. Second edition, they called it a second edition. Uh, it was the first edition with a, a insert added in the back. They didn't actually rewrite the, the whole text. They just added a, a supplement that they bound in with it. But they called it the second edition. And then I was really fortunate to be able to work with them uh, on the third edition, which is the last one, the 27 year ago one. So, Ron Gibbs has gone ahead and made a graph just to show you that as the years go by, the number of minerals in Arizona keeps going up and up and up, and we're getting close. Um, just put that in, the state fossil is petrified wood, which is, of course, a mineral. It's quartz. And now we know it has some uranium in it, perhaps, too, <laughs> so uh, uh, something extra. The state gemstone, turquoise, the state mineral, wolfenite. Again, thanks to a bunch of the people here to get that passed into the uh, state legislature. Of course, when I tell people that aren't mineral collectors, the state mineral is wolfenite. They look at you, they don't have a clue what in the world is that, you know. Uh, in the introduction, we do have a description of each of the three main public displays that you can go to, the one you're at today. Uh, one that uh, Anna obviously talked about, and then the Graham brothers, of course, have been real active in helping in a really good mineral museum uh, in Bisbee, too. So uh, those are the three places where you can see the most variety of good minerals in the state. The, second, the next chapter, chapter one, is about gemstones. So these are new chapters, and uh, it goes, I've We've gone into the history a little bit, back to Kunz and, and 
you know, some of the early history of some of the gemstones and some of the things that weren't normally in the text. Um, a couple of things for people to look for. There are a couple of reported interesting gemstone occurrences at some mountain, but the mountain doesn't exist. You know, Flag had one and somebody else had one. But, you know, apparently local people must have called those places those mountains. So there's a challenge for you, Barbara. You, 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 you're done with aquamarine. It's time to go find sunstone or var There's supposed to be varicite out by, um, you know, uh, somewhere out past Wickenburg there. Anyway, and most of you are familiar with the fire agate or the gem chrysocolla or the pair. So literally millions and millions of dollars worth of gemstones have been produced in Arizona uh, from the copper mines or from the mines at Peridot or from you know, the petrified wood, all the private property around the, around the forest. <coughs> we have a chapter on fluorescent minerals and you've seen a lot about fluorescent minerals today. You may see the eucryptite picture looks familiar. <laughs> You've seen it before. <coughs> Harvey Jong worked on it. He's found for sure 46 minerals. So there's a table with those 46 minerals listed that we know are fluorescent from the state of Arizona. A lot of those 992 minerals have never been actually checked. You know, a lot of them are just smaller micro mounts or something. So we don't really know how many fluorescent minerals there are in the state. I'm sure there's more than that, but those are ones we know for sure fluoresce. Uh, some of the things that uh, Dick talked about, we go through it in that chapter a little bit. Why do they fluoresce? And then the fluorescence under the different wavelengths. And some really good pictures. Uh, again, George Pullman has helped us. The Zimmermans have helped us. And so we have some good, uh, good things in that chapter. So, <coughs> Obviously, fluorescent minerals are becoming more popular among collectors, or so it seems. Uh, <clears throat> if we go to chapter three then, chapter three is the mineral occurrences. It's the main part of the book. We've taken all of the material from you know, the last edition, which had all the minerals, the, about 800 of them. Um, and you know, by county, it tells you where to find, you know, where they're found. And so, those have been kept. And what we've done is we've added on all the new species, and we say 233. Well, it's 233 new names because the, uh, we're going by all the, the official list of the IMA in their wisdom. And <laughs> they've discredited some of the minerals that were on the last edition. They've added new minerals, like we used to have a mineral of zeolite chabazite. Well, now we have chabazite CA, chabazite NA, chabazite K, chabazite, there's four or five chabazites. And if you go to any of the zeolites, it's the same thing. So there's a whole expansion of species, numbers of species, that in one sense they're not really new, but yet in another sense, you know, they're new names. They weren't named as such in the last edition. And these are just a few of the new ones. And, and the IMA has made ice and officially a mineral, so of course we have ice somewhere in Arizona, at least in your refrigerator. <laughs> so, uh, we've included that also. And then the fourth chapter, Stan Keith and Jan Rasmussen are here. And there they work extremely hard. And, and if you read the chapter, it goes into long detail about the history of the mineralization, the time periods and the uh, <coughs> igneous rocks and, and how the minerals all occur. So uh, it's fairly academic, but I think you know, people really get something out of it. And then associated with that chapter, we have these maps now for each kind. In the old edition, their mineral district maps are there. They're in the back. And they're sort of like a... Somebody at the last moment said, let's throw these maps in, they're kind of neat. But <laughs> they don't have any geology or any information, it's just a map of the county with a bunch of spots with names of the mineral districts. And there was no real attempt to correlate or make sure that the minerals in the descriptions you know, matched up with the names of the mineral districts. So. What Jan and Stan have done, which is just incredible, for every county, 
there's a map like this. And on that map, for each of these mineral districts, it tells you the, something about it, some fancy geology, but you, know, you can read about that. It tells you the commodities. So if you look like at our, our Amondo, the, the classification is PCO, and it's gold and silver, and it formed 60 million years ago in the age. And we've tried to get all of the occurrences, we weren't 100% successful, linked up to one of these specific mineral districts. So if you look up the mineral wolfenite, and you see that it occurs in an MCA silver lead 76 million years ago, then those are the, you can find those districts throughout the state. Those are the places to go look for wolfenite, maybe for some new occurrences. So what we're trying to do with that is encourage people to get out in the field and start looking. So you, you, you know the Raleigh mine is in a certain district, has a certain commodity, has a certain age. Well, there's another little district up here that you've never heard of, but it has the same geology, the same age, you know, the same commodities. Well, maybe there's a shot that there's a mine up there has wolfenite. It's worth the trip. It gives you an excuse to get out in the hills. So that's really, to me, I mean, I, I love those mineral district maps, and so to me, this is the best part of this whole book. And if you look in the old edition, the sort of thrown in at the end ones, there's no landmarks or roads or anything. And John Callahan, who worked for the USGS, did these maps. And so now there's roads and a little bit of topography, and you, you can actually sort of figure out where you are. So uh, to me, these are an absolute wonderful addition to the mineralogy of Arizona. And now Ron will push the button. Well, let's see what happens here. <laughs> um, so now we're into the appendixes, and uh, one of the appendixes talks about doubtful and discredited minerals. There's a few minerals that uh, have been passed down through the ages, like the mineral bisbeite, that as at one point, people thought, yes, it's definitely a species, maybe no, it isn't. It's not accepted by the IMA at this point, and then we have a mineral like duhamelite that was accepted, but then subsequent research discredited it. So it was in the third, but it's not in the fourth. We also have those situations where a mineral like uh, wolframite has been reclassified as a group name. It's no longer a species name. So there's some discussion of this sort of thing in this particular appendix. And then there's a whole section on type minerals. And uh, so now we've got 87 type minerals, or 26 that weren't in the uh, third edition. And uh, I think one of the earliest, one, or the earliest one, was spangolite. Uh, this particular picture is not the type locality, made of sunshine. And then, of course, recite in 77, and one of the most recent ones is uh, Ludong Shangite from the 79 mine. And so uh, we have a table listing where all these uh, type minerals came from and when they were uh, approved by the IMA. A new chapter, which is probably generates a little bit of discussion here and there, is organic minerals. Um, it's a fairly simple definition. It's, uh, it's got carbon in it. So we've got hydrocarbon minerals, we've got salts of organic acids, and we've got some miscellaneous. And we go into discussion of this because a number of new species have been identified and approved by the IMA from Arizona. I guess I better lower this. Um, and a lot of them have come out of the, the Rowley mine recently, all related to those curious little creatures called bats. But not all organic minerals are bat related. Uh, here's a couple of them, antipinite and David Brownite, NH4, the more recently discovered by Tony Camp. So we have a whole section on organic minerals. And even in Tucson, you can go out and collect organic minerals. If you've ever seen a saguaro cactus, you'll, you may not have known that it's full of the oxalate wetolite. As a living cactus, these things grow in the, in the saguaro. And when they die, if you were to cut open the decaying flesh, you'll find these little white spherules of, of wetolite. This particular specimen was found up on Push Ridge in the Santa Catalina Mountains, not far from where 
Lazaraskite was found. Now this mineral was only recently approved by IMA and it's the first naturally occurring glycolate. And there's a lot of discussion still about well, how in the world did this mineral form. But it, uh, it's got copper in it and it occurs with chrysocolla. It's a very interesting and unusual mineral. Um, I'm told that the locality has been buried by all the recent rains we've had, but uh, nevertheless, I think there's pieces out there. So a whole discussion of organic minerals, and if Tony Camp keeps going the way he's going, there'll be another dozen of them uh, pretty soon. Um, so here's the authors. Um, Harvey has done a lot of work on the fluorescent chapter, and he's contributed a huge amount to the occurrences check section. And his um, detail-oriented mindset has really been a big help to us. And Jan and Stan doing all the map work. Stan has been a resource as far as mineral occurrences because he's got some stuff tucked away in his brain that, that uh, all of us, most of us have forgotten years ago. <laughs> what am I holding? Um, that is the lucky rabbit. <laughs> the lucky rabbit used to inhabit uh, the mines of Granite Gap, New Mexico. And we had so much luck finding interesting minerals that when they were going to close up the mines and seal them up, I took the lucky rabbit home with me. <laughs> now, in order to get 300 photographs in the book, we need a little help. The U of A Press is willing to publish the book, but they need some extra funds to pay for the color photography. So we have these cute little flyers in the back, and they talk about the book, and they also give you ways you can donate to the color fund. But you have to be careful to specifically say that it goes toward the fourth edition of, of the book, so that they will you know, apply the funds correctly. So we, we've raised a fair amount of money already, and we're probably close to being halfway to the goal we have, and we could certainly use additional help. But before we go on to the next section, does anybody have any questions about the book? Okay. So as Monty Python used to say, something new. You know, people are always curious and they strive to find newness and that's how we got to 992. Well, Sid Williams, if you, if you knew Sid, he was an enthusiastic collector, a great mineralogist, worked for Phelps Dodge, and he sold specimens through his old business. At one point or another, he collected specimens from the tombstone area which is known for silver deposits and unusual lead and tellurium minerals. Well, he eventually died. In fact, he died in 2006, and a lot of his specimens passed on to Tony Nickisher at Excalibur Minerals. Well, Tony sold some of them, and he sold some to Brent Thorne, who's a well-known species collector from Utah. So the trail is getting longer and longer. Well, Brent studied his purchases very carefully, and he asked Tony Camp to check out a few interesting things. Well, Tony's done, as you know, he puts out many new species every year, it seems like, and he's, he's quite prolific. So, so uh, Tony gave it a good look, and he found something new. And so he went to some of his colleagues in the industry, uh, Stuart Mills and Aaron Celestian and Chi Ma and Dr. Young here at the University of Arizona, they all contributed to help him define a new species found on Brent's specimen. It's got this exciting formula, lead, copper, tellurium, sulfate, hydroxide, hydrated. It's a triclinic mineral. It was found in cavities and quartz associated with silver and gold lead, copper, and zinc. In these photos, you can see it's associated with uh, alunite and bakite, as well as cerusite, gerasite, and rhodocolarite. 
Now the crystals aren't big, we're talking 0.5 to 0.2 millimeters. And so, it was from the Grand Central Mine. This mine operated from about the 1870s on through about 1911, and maybe even sporadically after that. Mindat shows 25 species for the mine without listing this new one. This new one now has a name, it's been approved by the IMA, Flagite. Now Arthur Flagg, I think there's guys in the Flagg Foundation who probably know a lot about this fellow, but he's got quite a history there. Graduated from Brown University, he served as an assayer and a mine examiner and a mining engineer for a number of companies. Um, he founded or helped found the Mineralogical Society of Arizona, American Federation of Mineralogical Societies, the Rocky Mountain Federation of Mineralogical Societies, was the first curator of the Arizona Mineral Museum. And you've probably read articles that he's written over the years in Rocks and Minerals, uh, Arizona Highways, and he contributed to the, uh, what used to be known as the AIME, American Institute of Mining Engineers. Being a mining engineer, he, must, he was pretty high on my list. Um, you're familiar probably with these two books that he put out. Uh, the 1958 one is especially fun. I think uh, it would be a great exercise to go and just follow his journey from one end of the book to the other today in real life and see if those localities are still around. His legacy continues through the Flag Foundation and the MSA. So uh, congratulations, uh, Arthur Flagg, for having a mineral named after him.